Kim Hothead Hines is a longtime survivor of poverty and oppression. His experiences on the street have guided him to a life of passionate activism that has seen him involved in filmmaking, frontline work, and grassroots organizing within the street community. He currently runs the Transform Homelessness Advocacy Watch, THA, that witnesses, documents, records, photographs, and films life on the streets in Victoria. I'm a visitor in the Lagwangan Masonic territory here. Um, I always say that I'm under duress. Um, it's, uh, it's unseated. I understand there's a Douglas Treaty. It's very uh, uh, difficult being in a colonized city <laughs> where uh, uh, the, the nation is also still under you know, colonial pressure. So, um, and I'm a visitor from Winnipeg. I was born in the north end of Winnipeg. Um, my mom was a single mom on welfare. Um, uh, we're Acadian settler on my mom's side, so my mom was Acadian uh, French who came here in the mid 1600s on the East Coast. Um, and then the British came and the battle ensued, the old battle, um, and a lot of the, people, the Acadians were spread. Some people know that story. Um, my mom, being Roman Catholic, um, was, uh, fell in love with a man who was a rebel. Um, James Dean character, blue-eyed, you know, uh, not my birth father, but, and I'll get to that later, but, and she was 17, fell in love with him. Her brother was a, a boxer, light, lightweight boxer. My mayor uh, managed a, a restaurant. My prepare worked in, uh, in, on the train lines, and he was a diabetic. So that just helps give a bit of context to where we came from. And my mom was uh, pushed away from the family because she chose a non-Roman Catholic. Uh, he was a partier. Um, they uh, rebelled, got married at 17, pregnant with my eldest sister, Colette. Um, um, what was hard about the story, and, pe and it asked here, all these, uh, I love your, your questions, by the way, because lived experience of poverty, homelessness, professional, working in the field, lived experience, mental health and addictions, that's all of me. So I did a, I pulled one from each one to, to help tell my story, but and the conditions of our birth were harsh because this man who was young came from generational poverty and generational abuse, hardcore generational abuse, <laughs> generational alcoholism. Like uh, uh, Bob was beaten a lot as a child. His siblings were beaten. Their, <coughs> their parents were beaten. Before they got to these shores, they were beaten, and they came from people who were beaten by a colonial imperial estate. So it's, it's like... Uh, Turning points all through my life, that was one of them, learning that. The, the, the whole systemic ec economic system that creates unnecessary pain and suffering. It's not like normal pain and suffering. Not like in nature when, when people battled or had little you know, problems here and there. No, this is like serious freaking, uh, you know, creating a poverty. So when you have a church saying, you know, too bad, you made the wrong choice, and the family turns away from you, things don't go very good. And then you're in the north end of Winnipeg. <laughs> um, and uh, she went through being raped um, while pregnant with me. Uh, Bob punched her, slapped her in the stomach uh, because of a drunk he was on. He went down pretty fast because he didn't have any support either. Like none. He didn't have none. He came from where he came from. The first sign of emotional duress, he became violent. Um, his younger brother used to get the worst beatings all the time, and, and Bob was in the middle of that. But... Uh, so I, that there, you know, poverty affected our lives, <laughs> and uh, my first head injury was in the womb. So um, uh, it kind of affects my life. And then when I had, I'll, I'll get to this later. So, um, okay, how did stigma affect my ability to move forward? Well, it affected my mom's ability to move forward all our life. So by the time I was 15, even though my mom was not an abusive person, she was a very kind woman did the best she could once she figured out that things were bad in, in, in the North End. Um, there was no way that she wanted to you know, keep us all there because her, her own experience of violence, um, being stalked you know, and having men, good men that came into our lives, thank God for that, um, were uh, Leonard, uh, I don't remember his last name right now, my little sister's dad who was Métis and my father who was Métis, but that was a family secret that no one could still speak about, and that's Tommy Gladgey was my dad, who was uh, uh, Leonard's best friend. And it's a twisted, bizarre, wild story, but a lot of people have that story. Three dads, you know? 
Um, and we used to feel weird about it. I don't anymore. It's like it's, it's the way it was, and it's, it, it didn't reflect negatively on my mom for me now, but it sure did for her then. She had to deal with a lot of stigma. Um, the biggest stigma was when the church did that, you know, um, thrown into poverty, thrown into, like, the family, just saying, too bad, all these children, one after the other, 17, 18, and 19, you know? Uh, the, the man you love suddenly is the truck driver going away, and he's already getting messed up, right? Um, you start trying to figure out how to get out of it. Good men come to the aid of women in the bar, and that was Leonard and Tommy, they were musicians. <laughs> And uh, uh, my mom found those people in a bar in the North End. Like she went, she needed people to, to be able to be protected. <laughs> she was a five foot two woman in the North End. A lot of Eastern Bloc, uh, Second World War people were around us, surviving, trying to get through. Um, no community really. It was really just harsh survival. Everybody really stuck to their own uh, groups for s safety and security and um, that kind of thing. Um, in my own life, I, I ran away from home at 15, hit the streets then. Um, and one of the things I'm, I'm going to talk about now is that I was born, uh, the gender chosen at my birth was female. I'm transgender. I'm, I'm transgender. It's perfect timing for the book to fall. <laughs> um, I'm a transgender person. I, I was uh, identified as female in my life. I was always mistaken as a boy when I was a kid. Uh, Marita, a really cool babysitter. One of the people that protected us for the four years when I was six, seven, eight, nine, the last four years uh, before we left Winnipeg was a babysitter who was, you know, 13, 14, 15, and 16. She was tough as heck, Marita Henault. And she was good to us. Like, the people she hung out with protected us kids, like, protected us from bullies on the block and that kind of thing. We weren't uh, uh, tough kids. We just weren't into fighting. We just weren't. It was weird. I, and I don't know why. I think it was her mom. I think my mom just really, like, just demanded no. Like, she, like she was five foot two, but, man, when she had a temper, <laughs> you listened. My brother listened kind of thing. Yeah, and my, my mom and my brother ran away the year before I did. But So the, the stigma and poverty, and oh, my God. I mean, it's like some of the questions here. When you hit the streets at 15, it's like you're running. And I was post-traumatic stress disorder from child sexual abuse. Because of the vulnerability of my mom, she did the best she could, but there were so many situations, and I am not gonna, it's, I'm not going to get into details, but uh, I, I, I used to tell my story more, and I did that in Calgary years ago um, as a survivor, told that story, and I stopped telling it because a lot of people just have a hard time hearing that one person would have that much experience. I'm like, wow, I know people who <laughs> had way worse stories than I have, and, and it's, it's like, you know, people who go through being survivors of, of child abuse, sexual abuse, uh, sexual assaults, uh, you know, men experience it, women experience it. Um, I've, uh, at the hands of female-born people, I've been sexually assaulted when I was a young child and as a, an adult in the queer community. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's all over, and I really do acknowledge that um, there's a big, huge problem with male violence in our, in our society. I mean, you know, I think everybody can agree with that. And uh, we're pulling on the, you know, the moose hide campaign for warriors to come out because another thing that hurt us in this society is that the system doesn't encourage men to be warriors and protectors and defenders. It encourages us to run away and fucking, pardon me, get jobs and try, you know, it, everything's very, very hurtful of, of working poor and it's, it's very much a struggle and middle class are basically trying to hang on to the privilege, you know, that, that system takes from everyone else. Privileges are just rights taken from other people. And this, the really sick thing is we don't even have to do that. I was mistaken as male most of my life, and it got me into trouble a lot, but uh, it also helped me. So between 15 and 21, I just was on a suicide mission. Um, at one point, I got involved with fundamentalist Christianity for nine months, converted, <coughs> converted my whole family at 16, <laughs> um, ran away from home, got back with my family. We moved to Calgary. We got involved at the Calgary Christian Center. I was supposed to be the big next Catherine Coleman. I'm not kidding. Um, and then uh, I didn't, it was power stuff. The church was like, <coughs> sign here and this is what we want you to do. And, uh, tripping my mom out. My mom would come home and we'd talk and debrief about just weird meetings they're having with her because they were seeing me as money mm -hmm. for their church. And it I was like 16. I was in and I was like so disappointed and I was just like following actually the Bible. I was actually following that and I thought, I found a family, you know, and these people, this is amazing. My family now can have a family.
Big turning point for me was uh, Brian Rudd. I didn't know I was queer. I just thought I was this, you know, person who kind of looked like a boy girl, and I didn't think of lesbian, queer. I didn't think about all that stuff, you know what I mean? He came and spoke against queers. And I, I remember to this day sitting there crying. So he invited Calgary Gay and Lesbian Community, and I was like, Gay and Lesbian Community, what's that? <laughs> I was like 18, 17, young still, right before I went back to the streets. It's a bit mixed up because I'm 56, and I, I overdosed a couple times when I was using uh, carb fentanyl, even in the 80s was around. Um, and that was my bottom, but uh, my memory's a bit tricky. So he invited the queer community to this church. I was young. Uh, they had me in the front row. Um, and he went off this way with hate and like just going off about, just, I was in tears. And then these people that were women, they looked pretty butchy, dykes. Like I, I would meet them later, years later, after I get through all the streets, I would meet these people. It was the weirdest thing. They came up with a banner. And the banner was some message about, you know, God loves everybody or something, right? And that they were lesbians. They were all right there. <laughs> and I turned around and just like, it was a changing point. I mean, I, I ended up, you know, uh, lots of things happened. It was quite harsh, actually. And it, that's when I went to the streets and I was on a suicide mission. I believed I was going to hell because um, it, it really affected me, that, that belief. And it's not the true teachings. This is what I like about Animal House because it kind of gets that. Um, but that was turning point, and I just was on a suicide mission. I would hook up with whoever I could to survive, and we found each other as young youth, and we survived. Um, some of them were sex trade workers. Um, I was offered to be in the sex trade. I couldn't because I'm a survivor. I always worried that I would freak out and kill the guy. I mean, it just, it was my reality. And I just said to these women, look at no, I just, you know. So I was the watcher. I was the person who went in the corners, and, and it was 1979, and there was the, the street wars going on in, in Calgary. Uh, at the, historically, if you look into it, it was an interesting time. And uh, we hit the streets as independents, trying to not have pimps and that. The pimps were really pushing, a lot of violence. Um, so four of my crew hooked up. We all hooked up with a, a man, and I'm going to say this because it's important historically, a Le Lebanese male who was actually a good man. And at the time, the, gang, the gangs involved were Lebanese and different groups. They actually existed. We had to deal with them on the streets. He wasn't into that either. So all of us were independents from all these cultures of, of people who've been colonized. Do you know what I mean? And in all those groups, there are sort of rab rebels. That always, there's always been rebels. Like, look at the movies, kind of re reflect that. People are like, no, I'm just, you know, I run away from school, I left home. It's because, you know, the, the school system's unhealthy. I went on a, a fast down, I hit bottom, I was really bad, I ended up in detox, um, uh, I thought I was just doing the PCP, and it was the elephant tranquilizers, and I, I, a little thin line, the first time we did it, while I was hitting bottom, and I was looking for heroin a lot, and I couldn't find it, thank God, because um, I don't think I would have survived, I was really in a suicide place. Um, um, the, the sex trade I didn't get into, but I... Uh, uh, worked with these community as much as we could to survive. When we hit the streets, we got run out of town that night. Uh, it's, it's lucky none of us died. Some of us never saw each other again. Uh, it was intense. Uh, really ridiculous, uh, uh, hard to even talk about now, but literally I got into a car with the fellow who's Lebanese and uh, we went one way, the other women had to go other ways. Some of them went up north, some of them went west. Bunny went west and it never survived. Um, so most of the people I know probably, I don't know if they're alive, I keep trying to find some of them, but uh, um, that's the reality of the story. So I'm going to go right to, I get to detox, I was messed up, and there was a woman named Vi, who was a Baptist, and she was really not pushing anything, and I was really in a bad way, okay? I was coming to in the, in the rubber room in detox, and I remember her there, just really calm, I just keep remember seeing this face, <laughs> and then one time I remember walking up more, and, and she... Uh, talked to me a bit, and I was just mumbling stuff about going to hell, and, you know, just, it was, you know, she just listened. So I get out of the rubber room, I'm in the, the first day, and then it's the second day, and you have that meeting, and it was with Vi. And uh, she says, uh, <laughs> uh, I've been hearing you speak about, you know, that you believe you're going to hell, and you have a, a relationship with God, I'm a Baptist. And I was like, I was so relieved, I thought, man, she could confirm it, and, you know, like, it's like, I, I, it's almost like I expected her to, you know. And she said, I'm pretty sure God doesn't mind you put that struggle on the back burner for now. And I just, it just hung in the air and I just kept thinking, the back burner. 
the background. <laughs> God doesn't mind if I I mean, it just was this weirdest thing, and I just decided to believe it, and I did. And it really kept me in detox long enough to keep going back and experience other people. I, you know, the first meetings I went to was like, wow, other people have had these experiences. I'm like, wow, other people are survivors. And, and that's what kept me going. That was a big turning point for me. Uh, like someone just being, you know, we, we are still connected now on Facebook. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't believe in deities in terms of that way anymore. I used to identify as an anarcho-Christian. And it's not like I, it's just a personal belief. I'm, I'm not kind of, I, I, it's uh, hard to explain, but I believe in spirit, and I believe in that interconnection. So I have post-traumatic stress disorder like crazy, okay? I'm in advanced, late stages post-traumatic stress disorder at 56. Uh, early degeneration because of the early abuse, different bumps and this and that. Over time, you, get, you start getting arthritis. So it's great that you're doing that stuff because turning point, learning about health, learning about homeopathics, learning about herbalism, you know. Um, you know, the system didn't teach none of that, you know. When people say fight for the education, I'm not going to fight for a colonial education system that tells people lies. I'm going to fight for it to change because we, I want to go to school, but I can't go to that school. It's very difficult for, for some people to, and you know, we pull, we get whatever we can, wherever we can, and that's good for survivors. And for some reason, you know, we all have a place in production, and mine is, I can't help but live on the margins, and, you know, uh, why did I go working in the field? What else could I do? The stigma following us was crazy, but I was like this intense person who was like, I'm like, wow, this is great. So I became an activist in the early meetings. Like, uh, the first meeting I went to was an all-women, or the Glenmore group, a mixed, really big group. But because of my PTSD and I loved it, I kept going for years, I needed something smaller. And then there was a queer lesbian group, queer gay group, and I was like... And by then, I knew I was a dyke, and I went to that and formed a women's group. And they wanted to use the, the Lord's Prayer at the end and the serenity prayer at the beginning. And I said, you know, at the time, I was cool with the Lord's Prayer personally, but I said, like, that, it's not very accepting of others who aren't Christian who might feel really uncomfortable. So I, they, they wouldn't hear it, and they kept insisting. I was like, well, that's not real consensus. So I started bringing up at every business meeting this thing, and they're like, they'd go like this. And I was cool that I'd bring it up. And finally one day I brought up, I want to ask that we do the Hare Krishna chant at the end of our AA meeting. <laughs> and that's when they went, okay, we get you. We're going to have a moment of silence and we'll close with the serenity prayer. Because the serenity prayer was not religious. You know, it's more, more of a spiritual thing. And I, I, I kind of resisted that kind of authority, that kind of blind, just going with it. Um, when I was uh, 24, big turning point, uh, joined the feminist movement. It was big because I was angry at men, brother, man, holy. I didn't. I I had a lot of issues with men because of the, the assaults and the sexual assaults and stuff. Um, women were my thing, <laughs> and uh, still are. Um, but the feminist movement helped me a lot, you know, about politicizing stuff and uh, learning from them that the feminist movement wasn't just about for women. It's about for everybody. A lot of them were, had husbands and sons and boyfriends and they weren't all lesbians so that was another big like <laughs> realization um, and the anti-oppression 101 training changed my life it was a big another turning point um, and the, at the time I was uh, early sobriety at two years I was able to get involved in treatment I worked in uh, the halfway house I worked in treatment and then moved and then worked in outreach did peers outreach because of my work in the with sex trade workers you know um, and that's one thing I didn't talk about. In those years, six years, I, I was on the street one year. Calgary's cold. You can't be homeless there on the street. Not very many can. It's really harsh. So I, I went to the bars, the gay bars, and let women pick me up. And that's what I did for four years. I never had a home. I had actually five and a half. I had an apartment for a little bit, but I never really had a home during that time. And that's how I got a bed. It's the weirdest thing. I couldn't do sex trade on the streets because I just couldn't do it with men. And women weren't exactly out there. And I couldn't do it, I don't think, either way because I had too many issues. You know what I mean? This other equitable relationship where people pick each other up to have company worked better for me. Um, and I got fed and I had a bed and I didn't have to pay rent and I was very young. But um, another turning point, so I worked in all the community stuff but I couldn't really, here I am, I'm on disability, 5K, I'm on disability. Um, I have a daughter now who's 14, who I co-parent, and I, I transgendered hormonally at 41, I'm 56. And it helped me a lot. 
like it helped me a lot. Um, and there's lots more to say about a lot of this because I, I, I only have five minutes, so I'm going to try and focus on the biggest turning point for me was the harm reduction model um, and how criminalization was done by the U.S. government during the Second World War um, around the time the Germans were doing what they were doing and Britain was doing what they were doing around chemical warfare and all that industry. Uh, the U.S. got ahead of it sick and created a, a, a global law that said these particular pain relieving drugs that the planet gave us that people have used in nations for gener frickin' rations, um, you can't use or you'll go to jail. Like, you know, when I learned that, I'm in the decriminalization movement. If I say, if, I, if I'm asked, like, what's the one thing you would ask people to, 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 to focus on? Would be, look at community feminist-based movements, and, and from, especially from the 80s and 90s and the 70s, and, and don't believe just academic versions of what occurred during that time, because there were a lot of working class feminists working on the ground at that time, and we didn't get our books written. Um, but the women of color came to us and helped educate us on anti-oppression 101. There were South Asian women who, who really knew a lot more than we did, and it really helped. And they encouraged uh, the First Nations. That was when we started looking at you know, how First Nations fam community was just being lost, even in the women of color movement. So that was a big, huge beginning of my decolonization, you know, and I totally related to it. And so, and here's the big one, Martin Luther King, this statement, I can almost remember it, and it's hard of my memory. Uh, Martin Luther King, before he died, was about to do an international campaign for the eradication of poverty through use of a basic income and build homes now, right? Um, he was working a lot with unions, churches, building towards this, and he had a whole frickin' plan, man. And, and it's, it was smart, and it's really a smart one. But he said, when I realized there were more poor white men in America than poor black men in America, this was not merely a race issue. That's Martin Luther King. You know, that should be a quote every year that goes out. But we I have a dream, I had a dream. That's true, he did, and that's a good important piece. This other stuff in uh, community and chaos, community, chaos or community, where do we go from here? Good luck finding that book, but search for it, because if you get a copy, it's golden, and hopefully the library will bring it back again. Chaos or Community, Where Do We Go From Here? Outlays a lot of that. Um, and he believed that the white poor needed to organize with the blacks. And that's where it was going, and the government was like, no. And look what happened. The divide was easy. There's not one nation that's perfect. Everywhere there are people who struggle with power, and it's easy to, when you're suffering, to have someone go, here, here's $10,000 to help make some trouble there. I mean, we now know that uh, there's agent provocateur, RCMP, and police go into communities that are doing good. It's disgusting, you know? So th those kinds of things, it's like politicize the personal really helped me uh, keep moving. And th the thing of perseverance, I mean, I'm post-traumatic stress disorder. I did overdose twice. I did survive. Yes, I have memory problems. I struggle still with self-esteem, all that kind of stuff. And it's freaking amazing where I'm at like that I can uh, be involved in community and, and connect with people. And the way people are now compared to where they are, were in our time, it, it, it's like, I'm not judging our time. However, there's way more awareness now, you know, for uh, the fact that if we come together, you know, uh, and I think that's the whole thing. It's like, as long as we're coming together with other people and not just going into a tape recorder all the time, you know, you know, that's why AA at a certain point I had to reach out and move out because of harm reduction model. I needed it. I needed to feel like it's okay for me to have a prescription of cannabis instead of all those pharmaceutical things that hurt me, my gut. I can't do it. I have a file that says I can't do it. So I, I needed harm reduction community and that, that uh, I think I'm done. I'm just going to just check my notes. Mindfulness meditation. Uh, I'm going to talk about that because it, it's, it's has saved my life a few times. Um, Biggest obstacle, systemic oppression, you know, and us being stopped from getting together. We have to really work hard at getting together. Um, people of color know, it's, it's, it's sort of accepted, here's my ending, it's accepted in society, in my social justice community, and more and more in society, that women have to have the space to get together on their own to talk about women's issues. It's important. People of color need to do that. Why? Because we live in an oppressive system. And, you know, when you are oppressed because of a, you're poor, white trash, or you're a person of color, or you're black, or you're First Nations, um, it, it's, you have to get together with your own people and talk about things. It's important. <coughs> the poor are not allowed that.
still, <coughs> we're not allowed that. We're not allowed to just find a spot, get support to meet on our own without a manager. And it shows that it's kind of almost like the last frontier we can learn from the racist movement, or to the anti-racist movement. God, sorry about that one. We can learn from the anti-racist movements, the, the women's movement, you know, that uh, dealt with the, the power around sex and gender. We can learn from these movements. We, we really have to. And uh, we have a lot of allies. <laughs> like, I mean, uh, this is, I've been supporting this project since we met because of bringing people together. So, and thank you for listening. Am I done? Thank you. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Let's give it up.